Okay, we might make a start. Hello. Hello. I feel like... EDUC 2706. Hello. <laughs> Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this session. Uh, my name, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Eileen Honan. I'm from the University of Queensland and I'm the convener of the co-convener of the post-structural theory SIG. I just wanted to start, I'll do a brief introduction. The first slide I've got here is the title that's in the program. This is actually the title we submitted for the program. So some of you might notice that this is actually co-hosted by the Post-Structural Theory SIG and Politics and Policy SIG, and that um, the first slide actually gave Taylor a promotion. So his associate <laughs> professor, Taylor Webb. <laughs> what we want to now call this session, after having a discussion about it, rather than this kind of vague idea when we put in the proposal in May, is this, the key to all mythologies, Deleuze and education. Um, this is the information that went into the uh, committee, the AARE committee, um, where we said that Professor Ian Buchanan, who is on the right, um, is a renowned Deleuzean scholar, editing lots of books, founding a famous journal, and blah, blah, blah. And he is co-presenting in this forum with the, it says, author of numerous books, book chapters, and journal articles. Um, and he's co-presenting in this forum with the AERA award-winning Associate Professor Taylor Webb from the University of British Columbia, who is on the left, whose work uses Deleuzean theory to analyse international education policy, accountability and reform, blah, blah, blah. The forum will include brief presentations followed by an interactive audience discussion about the works of Deleuze and Guattari and their relationship to educational research. The forum will be video recorded and made available to the wider AARE audience after the 2013 conference. So that's what we thought we were going to do in May and that's what we thought or who we thought Ian and Taylor were in May. The reason we wanted to do this, and I've taken this idea, I've stolen the title from Sam Seller who talked about datafication or when potentiality is slaughtered on the altar of probability, which is a lovely term that I picked up from Sam yesterday. So you may know of Foucault's joke about the 20th century being Deleuzean, um, apparently not in educational research publications. Um, this is a nice little datafication of the presence of Deleuze in education. What I did was that I did a quick search of the ERIC database, the ProQuest database, and Taylor and Francis's website database. And looked at, I typed in the words Deleuze and education into the abstract with these year uh, parameters. And as you can see, there's kind of, now if I knew maths or stats or was channeling my stats partner, I think the word is exponential I'm looking for, and I'm hoping there's no one in the audience who can correct me. Um, that there has been an exponential growth in the interest in Deleuze and education. Um, these numbers do indicate a growing interest in education about Deleuzean ideas and how they can be put to work in thinking about education. When Greg Thompson was organising the Deleuze and Education Conference that's being held in Perth next week, um, and he was talking Ian and Taylor into coming to AARE as kind of a side trip, um, we thought it was a good opportunity to have a conversation about the possible connections. 
So I just want to unpack the title a bit just to make sure that everyone picks up on the literary illusion. And I've stolen this explanation from a website, so these are not my words. In, George's, in George Eliot's Middlemarch, Edward Casaubon spends his life in a futile attempt, attempt to find a comprehensive explanatory framework for the whole of mythology. He's writing a book which he calls the key to all mythologies. This is intended to show that all the mythologies of the world are corrupt fragments of an ancient corpus of, of knowledge to which he alone has the key. Poor Mr. Casaban is of course deluded. His young wife Dorothea is at first dazzled by what she takes to be his brilliance and erudition, only to find by the time he is on his deathbed that the whole plan was absurd and she can do nothing with the fragments of the book that she's supposed to put into order for publication. The search for explanations is a normal and healthy function of the mind as a rule, but it can become abnormal and pathological if it is allowed to develop to excess. The problem arises when we push the desire for explanation too far and impose our wishes on the world so as to make it conform to how we would like it to be. A very characteristic feature of the Casaban delusion is the belief that the universe is constructed like a kind of giant cipher, a cosmic intelligent test set for us by God, which it is our business to try to puzzle out. Mr. Casaban himself is, of course, an illustration of this, but he is following on a long tradition. Complete esoteric systems have been founded on this belief. And so I guess this is our attempt to say, well, that's not what we're trying to do. We don't subscribe to the Casaban delusion. We thought it would be useful to have a structure for this conversation and so Ian had the idea of a mini abecedier. abecedier. That's my attempt at French. Um, for those of you who don't know, although Deleuze never wanted a film to be made about him, he agreed to have uh, Claire Panet uh, film a series of conversations in which each letter of the alphabet would evoke a word from A as in animal to Z as in zigzag. The images you see here are stills from the videos and I hope you can see Claire Pane, who I always think of now as the girl in the mirror um, and Deleuze with his hat hanging behind him wearing a scruffy old jumper, unshaven appearing slightly amused and completely relaxed. Prior to starting to discuss the first letter of his ABC Primer, and this is from uh, Charles Duval's website, Deleuze mentions the premises of this series of interviews. The Pane have selected the ABC Primer format and had indicated to Deleuze what the themes would be, but not specific questions. He states that answering questions without having thought about them beforehand is something inconceivable for him, but that he takes solace in the precondition that the tapes will be used only after his death. So this somehow makes him feel great relief, as if he were a sheet of paper, even some state of pure spirit. But he also wonders about the value of all this, so in, since everyone knows that a pure spirit is not someone that gives very profound or intelligent answers to questions posed. So I want you to remember that when you pose questions of our panel <laughs> of pure spirits. So what we're going to do, how we're going to structure this, is that we're going to do a mini A to E, Abbasidier. And Ian's going to explain his understanding of a concept and so A for affect and then Taylor will elaborate on his understanding of the relationship to that con of that concept to education and then we're going to open the floor for a bit of discussion, maybe some examples from your own work, um, maybe some questions of the pure spirits on the panel 
Um, and then we'll move on to the next one, B for becoming and so forth. We are recording, so when you do ask a question from the audience, we're going to ask you to speak into a microphone, but it will only be your backs that will appear. So you don't have to worry about kind of privacy issues, hopefully. Well, um, turn around and speak to camera. Or you can turn around and speak to camera if you like. Then why didn't the camera person think of that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, we will begin. A for AFEC. Thank you. Professor Ian Buchanan, Associate Professor Taylor Webb. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Eileen. Um, in fact, I'm not going to launch straight into the Abbasid era. I'm going to say a few words as preparation for that, um, only a few. Um, one of the things that Deleuze says about questions uh, is that he says that we have the philosophy we deserve according to the questions we formulate. So the quality of the questions determines or shapes the quality of the philosophy that we have or the, the, the quality of the thinking that we're able to do. And one of the things that Deleuze was very insistent on always was the right to ask questions and the right to formulate questions and the right to formulate problems. What's interesting about this abecedaire format in a sense is that it's completely arbitrary but within that he then takes the opportunity to formulate the problems that arise in relation to these kinds of stimulations uh, and I think that's what's really interesting. The abecedaire, uh, if you are not fluent in French, has been um, subtitled uh, so you can get it in English or French or German or Spanish or whatever language you prefer. Uh, it's mostly on YouTube, but also you can buy it on Amazon as well. Uh, and it is quite sensational. Just to kind of give you a little bit of background, um, Deleuze always considered himself a pure philosopher in the sense of that he, his training was in philosophy, but he felt that he'd kind of worked what he called a bastard line, um, taking that from Melville. And he worked his way through all the philosophers that the French philosophical system regarded as uninteresting. Um, so he started with David Hume and he worked on to Spinoza and Nietzsche and Bergson and he was interested in pursuing what he called eventually transcendental empiricism um, which anyone with a philosophical background would immediately recognise as an oxymoron. How can you have transcendental empiricism? Um, to try to define that for you to kind of set the scene, so one of the ways in which I'd like to talk about it is Empiricism is often defined in terms of knowledge arising out of experience, but what that means is that it's knowledge that arises without any prior concept. So you, you can't have a notion of God, you can't have a notion of truth, you can't have a notion of fact. All those things must arise out of experience. So one of the examples that he gives taken from Leibniz is of uh, swimming or being on a boat in open water. If you're out in open water, navigating in that situation is impossible unless you look at the stars or, or whatever. If you're looking upwards at the stars, those are like the transcendental elements. Those are the things that you're importing into your situation to try to make sense of it. But if you only looked at the water, you would have no way of navigating until you started to look at the water and think, well, I can see how this current goes. So there's a story that says that the, um, in Hawaii, for example, that the islanders can navigate between islands without being able to see the island that they're travelling to because they're able to see the currents in the water. Now that's pure imminence, being able to see the currents in the water using your experience to develop knowledge and develop truth out of it. So that's what Deleuze means by transcendental empiricism, that from that imminence arises the transcendental, arises the kinds of concepts and categories that we create that we use to navigate our way through life. So that was the kind of philosophy that it was interested in producing. He became very interested in schizophrenia because schizophrenia to him posed a kind of insuperable problem and he felt that Freud had totally misunderstood uh, schizophrenia. In his defence, Freud also said that he didn't really know that he understood schizophrenia either because the schizophrenics tended to be locked up and put in asylum so he never really actually worked with any directly. Um, but they felt that that Deleuze felt that there was something about the schizophrenic use of language that was particularly interesting and particularly important. Um, 
he had a student who was a medical student at Lyon, and he got in touch with him and said, look, I really want to understand schizophrenia. And this student of his was, at that time, working as a psychiatrist at a clinic uh, in the south of France at Laborde. Uh, this student said, well, look, I know just the person for you to meet. It's Guattari. Um, you should talk to him. And they duly met. Uh, Deleuze, at that time, was recovering from having a lung removed. Um, so he was kind of convalescing. Um, and they, apparently they met and they spoke and talked and talked and talked uh, and got on famously and decided that they would write a book together. Now, what's interesting about this scenario is that at that time, Guattari didn't have a degree. He didn't ever get around to finishing his degree in um, pharmacy. Um, and he'd never written a book. Uh, he'd written one article, but he hadn't actually really written anything. So he was kind of horrified when Deleuze says, let's write a book together. Um, and so he had to kind of promise Deleuze that he would take up this daily routine of sitting in a room and writing stuff down, which he did. And then he would send them as letters to Deleuze, who would read them and take what he wanted from them, but more or less ignore. And then Deleuze would write passages and send them to Guattari, who would make comments and send them back, and Deleuze would ignore them and keep writing. Um, and there's, when people ask them afterwards, well, who wrote this bit and who wrote that bit, they, they always refuse the question as being ridiculous and, and, and uninteresting. And, and one of the things that they say, which is, I think, quite fascinating, is that nobody seemed to understand what it really meant to collaborate. That what they did and what is so sensational about their work is that they kind of set up an emblem of collaboration uh, that I think has inspired many, many people. And they refused the idea of owning any of their text. And when the next book came out, A Thousand, uh, a Thousand Plateaus, which they took seven years to write, what's really interesting about that is if you go through the footnotes, you think, how on earth could anybody read all that stuff? I mean, not just the, the sheer volume of material, but it's, it's heterogeneous. I mean, there's, there's music, there's anthropology, there's pure mathematics, there's physics. Nobody can read all that stuff. And, and the reality is they didn't, strictly speaking. Their students did. Every week they would have a seminar and they'd say, this week we're going to talk about music. And then the next week all the students would bring in, I read this fabulous thing about music. And they would run a whole series of seminars around that, just piling in everything that they found. Then they would move on to the next topic and the next topic and the next topic. So when you read that book and you think, oh my god, how can I possibly get my head around all this stuff? Well, bear in mind it was a collaboration of 30 or 40 people. It wasn't just two people sitting in a room writing it. So it's, there's an immense richness to the work. And it really is a kind of sign of genuine collaboration. Quite spectacular. And I say that because a lot of people say to me, oh, I started to read that and was, you know, couldn't, couldn't get my head around it. It's too confusing. It's too this. It's too that. Uh, and I'm going to answer some questions about that in a moment. But I think one of the things I, I, I found is that just let it wash over you. Just kind of get into it and let it wash over you. And then worry later about whether you can make sense of it. But, What's interesting is for me, as somebody who is kind of across a lot of what's happening with the Deleuze studies, because I edit a journal so I see what people are working on, the, the real mainstay of Deleuze studies is in fact creative artists. And the creative artists who read it and have no idea what it's about and don't care, because they're inspired by it. They're just kind of, oh, I read this and it took me off on this kind of fabulous journey. And then they, they make art and so forth. And I think that's fab fabulous. And, and that's something that I would want to kind of encourage. Um, as, as you start to read it. Okay, so I thought in a sort of David Letterman style, um, I might start by giving you the top five reasons why you should read Deleuze. Because um, I imagine that a lot of you are sitting there thinking, well, why should I read Deleuze? Um, I don't know if I'll be able to sell it to you, but I thought if I give you some reasons, that might encourage you to do that. So the first reason is it gives you a new kind of ontology, okay? Uh, a new way of conceptualising the notion of being or what it means to be. Now, Deleuze was very straightforward about this. He says, there is only one ontology, it's univocal being. Um, the most straightforward way of saying that is stuff exists. Um, and after that, we don't really need to say much more about it because it exists. Uh, we don't have to doubt that it exists. Uh, the question is, in what state does it exist? So Deleuze talks about notions of uh, non-linearity, or what we might think of as a, a kind of a complex system for causality. So in terms of thinking about being, we're also thinking about causality, how do things come into being. So for those of you that have read Heidegger, you know that Heidegger kind of fudges this question because he just sort of says everything gets thrown into being. Um, so Deleuze has a slightly different answer, which is that things exist 
But they exist in a state of flux, that they are constantly evolving, transforming. They are always coming into being, but they're never really fully in being. And that's what's fascinating about them, that they're able to keep changing all the time. So that's the first reason. And a lot of people find this ontology quite difficult to get their heads around. But I don't think it, it needs to be a stumbling block. You just simply need to take the view that you know, what they're offering is a question mark around the nature of the being of things. So one of the ways you might see this work is if you read Latour. So Latour often asks questions about well, what is the status of the being? What, what is the constitution of a network? You know, so if he talks about um, a, a laboratory, in a you know, sort of scientific laboratory, he says, well, what, what constitutes the laboratory? And he follows networks and says, well, this laboratory couldn't exist if there weren't trucks coming in daily to deliver the gas to run the Bunsen burners and if chemicals weren't coming in. And if the lady who makes the sandwiches didn't bring the sandwiches in, then the laboratory wouldn't function in the way that it does. And if the air conditioner didn't work to purify the air and so on. So the being of the laboratory is, is kind of challenged. Um, so I, I, I've spoken to people who work in education. Uh, I, used to, I, I ran a, um, a workshop on Deleuze for Stockholm University uh, in the, the pedagogy department of the School of Secondary Education. And so we spent a session asking the question, you know, what is the being of the classroom? What is the being of pedagogy? What is the being of learning? What does it mean? What, what are we actually talking about? So I think what, one of the things that Deleuze has brought to what we call post-structuralism is to put a big question mark over the, quest over the idea of the being, of, of what the thing is, and to ask us to think widely about the nature of the being of things. Second, second reason why you should read Deleuze or Deleuze and Guattari is that they provide a conceptual apparatus for dealing with complexity. So what do we mean by complexity? Um, one of the things I, I, I would want to say that complex systems doesn't mean complicated, okay? I always find it quite fascinating on Facebook where people put, you know, is your relationship single, married, or it's complicated? Always wonder what that actually means. Um, I wouldn't want to go there in terms of thinking about what complexity means. So complexity means, at a minimum, uh, multiply constituted, that you can't say what a thing is in, and narrow it down to a series of essences, that this, this is the essence of a thing. Rather, it has a multiple constitution. So to go back to like the classroom argument, where does the classroom begin and end? So is it the four walls around it? Is it the homes where the kids live? Is it the government looking down and telling you you must do this or that? You know, people formulating curriculum elsewhere. So complexity, to think about something like education, you can't think about it in a simple way or in a straightforward way. You can't draw a square and say, only these things count as education. Okay, so to think complexity means to try to think about multiple, but more importantly, heterogeneous kinds of things. Okay, so when I say that Deleuze and Guattari provide an apparatus for thinking complexity, what I'm trying to say is that they provide an apparatus for thinking heterogeneous things together. So the physical space of the classroom alongside the diet, what do the kids have for breakfast, alongside an ideology of education, alongside curriculum production. How do you think those heterogeneous things together? How do you think the nature of their interaction? Okay, so that I think is something that Deleuze and Guattari provide. Thirdly, they provide a non-representational uh, model of desire. Now what does that mean? So Freud is our perfect example of a representational model of desire, that we only desire things because they remind us of something else. So if you're like me, you have a middle-aged crisis, and you think, well, I'm going to buy a Porsche, which I didn't do, I bought a bicycle. But if you bought a Porsche, then the, the idea is that you know, it represents or it's somehow phallic or something like that. So that your desire for that thing is representational because it it's, reminds you of or it's a representation of something else. But what that means is it's very difficult for you to then say, why do I desire this thing in particular and not that thing? Why that car and not that car and so forth? So what Deleuze and Guattari try to do is to conceptualise desire outside of a representational model and in what they call an, an affirmative way to, to think about desire in terms of not I desire it because I lack it, but I desire it for its particular affirmative qualities. So, so this is something we'll come back to. Uh, the fourth one, conception of ideology that is not premised on deception or false consciousness. That we don't simply desire things because we're stupid or because we've been deceived. 
uh, or because we have a, a, a false sense of the world. So one of the reasons why people don't read Adorno and Horkheimer anymore, although I think they really should, is that the, the kind of premise of their argument is that ultimately we have been deceived. Uh, and they kind of set themselves up as being the people who haven't been deceived and they're he here to tell us what the truth is. Now, even if you actually then agree with the, some of the, their critiques of culture, it's still pretty hard to stomach the fact that they basically think you're a moron and that you've been deceived. So what Deleuze and Guattari are trying to say is, well, no, ideology doesn't really work that way. It's not a question of deception, that we must actively desire the things that we do. And it's actually quite a complicated question and, and it's something that we'll talk about more. But one of their provocative statements is to say, at a certain point, in Germany, 1933, people desired fascism. There was something about fascism that appealed to the people at that time for all kinds of complicated reasons. And unless we're willing to kind of grapple with that and say, well, what was the desiring process there? Why did they desire fascism? Why was it important uh, and, and significant to them at that time? We, we're never going to understand it. Last one then, they give us a theory of signification uh, or a, a model of semiotics that is not based on signifier signified. A model that says this is a sig the sign over here and this is what it really means. They give us a different kind of a model, one drawn from the Danish philosopher Jomslev, uh, which we can talk about more later, but basically what it means is it's not representational. We don't say this means this because it reminds us of that, that there is a kind of chain of signification. It's a different kind of a process and again it goes back to complexity. Okay, so I have Five other things I'm going to say very quickly. These are the top five questions that I get asked at every single Deleuze conference I ever go to, uh, I, and I go to a, a few, and these are the questions that people who are kind of new to Deleuze always ask me. Um, the first question is, do I have to read everything? Because um, there's like 50 books. Um, the short answer is no. <laughs> you don't have to read everything. The question that always goes with that is, well, where do I start? Can I be selective? Which books should I read? Which ones can I ignore? I'm always hesitant to answer that question in any concrete way, but I certainly think it's possible for you to start with Anti-Oedipus or A Thousand Plateaus and see where that takes you and then go from there. The second question would be, and frequently is, do I have to read them in chronological order? Do I have to start with Hume and, and work my way forward and then read A Thousand Plateaus and, and so on and so forth? Again, no perfectly possible to you know, drop in anywhere in the career moment um, and have a look at it and see if it interests you. Do I need to read all Deleuze's works before I start reading Deleuze and Guattari's works? Uh, again, no. Uh, once you're really familiar with Deleuze's works, you'll see that the structure of Anti-Oedipus and A Thousand Plateaus replicates his earlier work. So difference in repetition and the logic of sense will give you the structure of A Thousand Plateaus and Anti-Oedipus. Um, but you don't need to know that. You can just simply launch into those two books and you can figure that out later. Do I need to read Nietzsche and Bergson and Freud and all those people before I read Deleuze Guattari? No, but I do recommend reading some Freud. It's pretty hard to get through Anti-Oedipus, particularly if you don't have at least a smattering of Freud. Um, you need to read, I think, the essay on the unconscious and you need to read at least one of the case histories, preferably The, the Wolfman, um, but that, that's probably enough, and then you can kind of launch into it. And the last one is, do I need to read biology and maths and so forth before reading Deleuze and Guattari? Again, the answer is no. I went to a Deleuze conference, this was 15 years ago, and this postgraduate student stood up and said that, you know, she'd had done, she'd taken three or four months out of her thesis work to go and study plant biology so that she could really understand the rhizome. And I said to her afterwards, why didn't you spend three or four months reading Deleuze <laughs> in order to understand the rhizome? Um, and that was insulting apparently, so she didn't speak to me again after that. Um, but again, it's a kind of strange question. You don't, you don't need to go and read plant biology. They're not trying to you know, make a contribution to, the, to world knowledge on plant biology. They're taking an idea of the rhizome to talk about something else. So don't go and read plant biology in order to understand the rhizome. Read the rhizome and try to figure out where that gets you. Okay, so enough by way of introduction. Let's launch into now affect. Um, I can see that um, Taylor is getting anxious to get up here and um, uh, take the mic away from me and deconstruct everything I said. Take it off in a whole other uh, way of going. So one of the things that I find about concepts, I actually wrote a dictionary. It's not something that many people do, um, and I did. I wrote a 200,000-word dictionary of critical theory, 
And one of the reasons why I agreed to do it was, apart from you know being secretly a masochist, um, is that I thought that it would actually be quite good discipline. See, Dis <laughs> there's the masochism. But I thought it'd be a really interesting process to think, well, A, it's going to compel me to read a whole bunch of stuff that I wouldn't otherwise read. Uh, and secondly, the process of trying to define things is, is an amazing discipline to, tr to actually say, OK, in 500 words, I've got to define this in such a way that an undergraduate who hasn't read anything will begin to understand it and can, can make it useful. Very, very interesting process. So one of the things I, I get my PhD students to do, and, and I recommend anyone to do, is to actually try to write definitions. So when you're reading Deleuze and Guattari, try to write a definition. If you can't write it in 500 words to explain to somebody else, then quite frankly, you probably don't understand it. You're kind of kidding yourself. So try to write some definitions. One of the things that, that Jameson always says, which I, uh, Frederick Jameson is a literary study scholar, he says, which I, I fully agree with, he says, it's fine for us to say concepts are undecidable so long as we don't stop trying to decide them. So it doesn't matter if you don't fully get the concept straight away, but keep trying to get it, keep refining it, keep working at it. So don't just kind of write it off as undecidable and be content with that. I also think it's important to have cutting edges to your concepts, to say that this concept goes so far and not there, that there is a point at which we can disagree. No, it means this, it doesn't mean that. Because otherwise what you have is adjectives, um, and that's not what we're about. We want concepts, we want them to have limits, we want them to mean this. Sure, they can be expanded and they can be you know, revised, re-engineered, but if they don't have definite limits, they are just adjectives, they're not concepts. So with that in mind, I'm going to throw some conceptual definitions up for you, um, and we can argue about them, and hopefully that will be productive. So the first one is A is for affect. So what is affect? Affect is difficult to define because where do you draw the line between affect and emotion and feeling? It, it travels in the same carriage with those things, so it's difficult to know where you should separate them out. In terms of Deleuze and Guattari's use of the term, it certainly has affiliations with feeling, but not with emotion. So it's more on the feeling spectrum than the emotion spectrum. They define affect as pre-personal, okay? So affects are the feelings that you have that pre-personal, before the advent of the person or before the advent of the subject or of consciousness. So one of the ways which we can think about it is to say, well, what is the affect of, let's say, anger? Now, if you think about how that comes into being, affect is when you're a child, you have certain kinds of feelings, but you don't know that they're anger you just have the feelings, you just have this agitation. But your mom or your dad or your teacher or whoever says, oh, why are you being so angry? And so you learn to code those set of feelings that you're experiencing as being anger, but they're not anger to you, okay? They are feelings, they are agitations, if you like. So what Deleuze and Guattari are talking about with respect to affect is those agitations that you haven't yet coded as anger or you haven't yet coded as love or you haven't yet coded as something else. And, and most of their theory is around the ways by which these kinds of feelings are coded and the ways by which they are then decoded, overcoded and recoded and get caught up in a larger set of discourses. So if you think about the example of anger, you, you know, you're the kid in the classroom, you're feeling something, the teacher's really pissing you off or whatever, and the teacher says to you, you know, why are you so angry? And you're like, I didn't know I was angry, but if you say so. And then the teacher is saying to you, well, you know, stop being angry, that's not good behaviour, blah, blah, blah. That sense of the way in which you are feeling is not just being captured then by an interaction between you and the teacher, it's being captured by a larger interaction about what is appropriate in the classroom, who determines that, why can't you be angry? Um, and in fact, you know, part of me says we need more of it. Uh, I, I, as a sideline project, I've been thinking that it would be interesting to write uh, a sort of a book or maybe just a short provocation or maybe something in the conversation, Stuart can write it, um, that talks about this, you know, the past 30, 40, 30 or 40 years where we've moved from critical inquiry to appreciative inquiry. Like we used to be allowed to be critical of stuff, now you have to spend all your time saying what's good about it. 
Uh, I always used to like that there's this fabulous book that came out in Britain. The book's actually terrible, but it has the best title ever. It says, is it just me or is everything shit? Um, and I think, you know, we're kind of missing that. We're missing the moment where we can say that we really want to be critical of these things. Um, so I think that that's, you know, in a sense, when we're talking about affect, we're talking about these feelings which haven't been coded, we don't know what they are, and they get coded, they get called anger, they become turned into emotions. Now, Deleuze and Guattari say that these things are singularities, that we each experience them in our own way, that what I think of as being anger is not necessarily that what you think of as being anger, and what I think of as being calmness is not necessarily the same thing for you. And that's one of the reasons why we can't understand when somebody's anger boils over, because we think, well, it wouldn't happen to me. But how do we know that what we think of as anger is what they think of as anger? So it's opening that question up. So what does affect mean? Well, it's opening the question, and it's what I was saying to you before about the idea of being. We don't know the being of anger. We know that it is constituted out of certain kinds of feelings, but we can't be sure that those feelings are the same for everybody and how deeply they're felt and how difficult that might be to be coded by other kinds of discourses. So affect then is a question mark um, and it's something that we want to work into our discourse and as we try to think of a complex system, we're working into it then as you know, the, the kind of the element of the system that can cause the whole system to explode. Okay. Thank you. Um, it, uh, I'm always reminded of when we talk about affect. I, I talk to my students about, and I'm going to uh, talk about medicine and nursing just for a second in an education conference. But the way um, nurses administer um, pain medication, it's a very, it's a very um, uh, open-ended realm in which we, we don't understand the pain that someone else is experiencing. And so in that sense, we can't judge the affect of someone else at that moment. And so it's very much a, a discretion at that point. Um, however, to return to um, um, uh, education for a moment, um, I really like this space between um, affect feeling, that is, and emotion, and uh, the space in which that is coded and decoded and recoded in a sense. And in education, I think that um, Diana Masney and David Cole, for instance, um, both together and separate, really give us a way to begin to think about the codings, recodings, and decodings of affect in what they call a multiple literacy theory. Um, and in this sense, I think um, it helps us begin to think about how we might understand affect, but really how we might take affect in different directions as well. Um, and in this sense, I think that what um, many other people in education begin to see is affect then becomes a site for perhaps a possible new um, uh, experience with affect. And perhaps even, um, as I'll, sp I'll speak with like Stephanie Springe or um, Jan um, Yadzinski, apologies, where we might even begin to think about new subjectivizations through the recodings of affect. Um, and in that sense, I, just to say, I agree with uh, Ian very much in the sense that we need more of it. Um, and there are many wonderful um, uh, uh, people in education thinking about affect, particularly in um, uh, performance education. So I improvisational theater, for instance, and here I'm thinking of Mia Perry, um, but also in the visual arts um, and so on and so forth in education, where we're actually trying to generate more and more affect of it or have more of it in a sense. Um, this is both sort of fun and dangerous in the sense because you're creating things that need to be understood in the sense of coding and recoding and decoding these spaces between affect and emotion. Um, um, and in this sense, I think what's really fascinating, and some people have picked up on this specific, um, specifically Jessica Ringrose, is how affect then can operate as a political force for different bodies. And so I would disqualify that in a sense as a micro-political force for different bodies. So we can begin, and that's kind of the Deleuze and Guattari um, idea of a spatial politic there. But here, affect isn't just about uh, emotion and how we might read it, understand it, apply it, but how we might experiment with it, um, strategically even. Um, and one example of that is Jessica Ringrose's work around um, some of the youth studies she does with sexting. And what, what I find fascinating in Jessica's work is how she begins to map 
some of the micro political uses of affect through. I have to say, I don't really know all this stuff. The kids are used the Twitter and the. And she's, she has a much more nuance, and I wish she was here to speak about it. But, you know, they take uh, photos of their bodies or I don't know what of each other and send it out into the into the. Uh, you know, places where they read all this stuff and titillate each other and comment, but more importantly comment and bully each other through some of the cyberbullying stuff. But here at Affect, what Jessica does is begin to map some of the political uses of Affect through this internet, and I think it's quite good in that sense. Um, I think if you wanted to follow up, maybe some secondary literature, I think um, Nigel Thrift does make that distinction between um, Affect and emotion. And I think what's really neat, too, is in education, we might begin to think about intensity, too, in relation to affect. Um, and I don't know if we might even call that a, a pre-pre-coding of affect, in a sense. But that, that idea of intensity, too, where we have no idea what that is, other than we sense it, in a sense. And that, um, maybe final out, at least in terms of education, is Ina Semensky is doing some very interesting work in how we might develop new senses if you will, to perhaps recognize or understand the intensities um, rather than just perhaps through haptic or other, other forms. Um, and so Ina's kind of developing intuition, for example, as a way to think about that. Um, but there's many, t uh, Ina's doing quite a number of things around sense right now. Um, uh, affect. Questions? David. Hi. Yeah. Um, no, I, you know, it's, uh, I, I haven't got any, any specific question. You know, I said an example at educational research recently when I was, I was at the back of a classroom that, and, um, you know, I suddenly became aware of all the kids around me were all on their, mi their mobile phones hidden under the desks <laughs> doing all these other things, you know, so there was one discourse coming from the teacher. They were all in their individual virtual worlds. You know, and, and, it, and there was an effect going on of kind of, there was a discontinuity between what they were meant to be doing and what was actually happening. And so as an educational researcher, how do you understand that? How do you document that? How do you write about that? And so I, for me, this, this pre-personal affect is, is, is a perfect kind of way into that. As you say, Jessica has written quite extensively about these sorts of things. And, uh, because it, it does leave all this kind of fuzziness, you know, really open, so. Uh, I'm going to ask your question. Right. Do you want to elaborate on... Given that um, Taylor specifically mentioned your work with Diana right. Masney around the decoding, recoding between affect and emotion, I wondered if you would like to just slightly elaborate on, on that for those of the people in the audience who don't know about that MLT stuff. Right. Um, Sorry. <laughs> it's, you know, we've, we've written a lot about, about this. Um, and it's, I, I suppose that the, the, essential, the essential thing that, you know, I was, I was recently reading a review of one of our piece of multiple literacy, and, it, and the reviewer said it's, it's a post Freudian reading of affect. You know, so I, as, as kind of being said, you're going to reading, reading the Freud and the sort of Deleuze, Guattari, Antidipus uh, retake up of that in terms of territorialization, re territory, you know, and all that stuff. You know, so that kind of gives you a, f a frame into it. It's, it's opening up these pathways in education where, you know, especially like literacy, it can be so coded as spelling or reading comprehension or, you know, all these, these kind of, I'd say, these. these you know, granny practices which have been the same for hundreds of years and you, you recognize them as this is what literacy is. Uh, so to think of it in a completely new way in terms of multiple literacies which are these kind of qualitative rhizomatic structures that go in and out of consciousness and you know sometimes we don't understand, sometimes we get a full you know grasp of the, of the complexity of, uh, in, in young children's uh, you know representations of themselves or the world and things like that. Um, so that's kind of part of it. Right. Okay. Is that a question? So, is it, is it a 
Um, I'm really interested, I, I come from a visual arts background and now um, applying that in, in education, educational research. Um, so I'm really, uh, in my readings of, of affect and, and with uh, Deleuze, um, I'm interested in the, this idea of, uh, say, the encounter with, with the work of art um, and the, the affect, um, perhaps, um, in that way being pretty personal, being um, a sensation and a movement that is um, of a non-human origin. Um, so it's not necessarily um, uh, make, subjectifying us because we don't uh, even understand what it is. Um, um, and similarly, so, so you know, with the magnificent sort of landscape, the color, the, the, the sensations that, that wash through us, um, is, is, does that fit with this notion of affect that you're describing, or is that more of a, another, a different interpretation? Uh, absolutely fits with it. Um, one of the examples that Deleuze gives is taken from literature. Um, and so if you have a, a line in a poem or whatever that says, it's five o'clock in the evening. So five o'clock in the evening is a kind, is clearly a demarcation of a, a particular time. But in terms of your memory of it was five o'clock in the evening, it's not so much that it was at a particular time, it was that it was at the end of the day the sun was setting, the wind was blowing, you were with your girlfriend or your boyfriend or you, know, you were drinking a glass of wine. So your memory of that is, is a series of affects that you can't put into simple words. And so in a sense, poetry evokes those affects but doesn't capture them and constantly fails to be them. Um, so the idea then of affect is that affect constantly exceeds language but by the same token, we use language or we use the visual to provoke and to evoke and to create those affects. And, and that's why the idea of signify, signify doesn't work because you can't say that five o'clock in the evening signifies those things because it doesn't signify those things. It evokes them. And if you think about your memories, you don't remember every single day, every single five o'clock. You remember five o'clock at that precise moment but somehow that becomes emblematic of all other kinds of, of experiences. Uh, so yes, absolutely, it, it, it sits side by side with that. And so in Deleuze's discussion of Bacon's paintings, for instance, when he's talking about affect, it's precisely that that he's trying to talk about, but that's what the artist is trying to, to capture and to, to evoke, um, but not in a representational way. This doesn't represent that affect, but rather you can only really understand. So you think of the the paintings of the Pope and the scream and that sort of stuff. But th there's a kind of power to that, that you can't say this image signifies something, but rather it evokes something, it, it produces something. And, and that's what they're talking about with, with the idea of affect. Were there any other questions on affect or shall we leap forward onto the, the next letter? I'm conscious of the fact that we're probably gonna run out of time, but go ahead. Just very quickly for me, Just, um, so, so that, links so nicely, just continuing the idea of the arts, into why you're talking about the improvisation and, and dance and all this, because it so readily links to this concept. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, let's... Um, oh, there's another question? Oh, no. Um, I was just going to say that obviously I'm um, a lot of the processing work that's done in drama and theatre, so process drama and theatre um, work as actually being a pedagogy of affect, um, a pedagogy where um, different people within the audience are working together to kind of reinvestigate the world they're in. And the playing out of the multiple personas and perspectives actually um, changes by disembodying their own position to the event. It actually creates an effective situation which maybe enables them to rethink so it's like, it's almost like a pedagogy of affect, the way that it plays out, I think. And then, um, that's why so many theatre makers are actually so attracted to this theory. Yeah, probably I'd only be doubtful about the last part about creating empathy. So I was just saying, I'd probably, from a Deleuzean perspective, I'd probably only be doubtful about the last part about creating empathy, because not to say that that doesn't happen, 
but that would not be something that you could prescribe to happen. So Deleuze and Guattari tend to be very uh, suspicious of the possibility of programming something. They, t they speak more about invention and experimentation. One of the outcomes may well be that, but you couldn't program it to start with. Um, you know, for all of us who've had to sit through uh, consultants coming to departments to tell you how to think, um, you know, you can't just think about something because someone decides to tell you to think about it, and you can't feel something because somebody tells you to feel it. Uh, so Deleuze and Guattari are very kind of sceptical about that, uh, which is not to kind of gainsay what you're saying, but to say, well, in any kind of situation like that, it will be an experiment, um, and that's precisely what makes it interesting. And, and I would assume that most artists would think the same thing, that if they could just simply program it, then that wouldn't be interesting. It's actually the possibility that they could fail spectacularly that makes it exciting to them. OK, so let's move on to becoming. Um, becoming is often given in a train of becoming animal, becoming woman, becoming this, becoming that. Um, it's in many ways, particularly the term or notion of becoming woman, um, the most controversial uh, concept that Deleuze and Guattari have had uh, for fairly understandable reasons. The early feminist response to Deleuze and Guattari was borderline allergic um, to that idea. Um, There's near sort of anaphylactic shock at the very idea of becoming woman. Um, I think probably that was deliberate, but maybe not. So what do they mean by becoming? So one of the things they say about becoming is becoming takes place on the body without organs. Now this is far and away the least understood concept uh, that Deleuze and Guattari have, have constructed. Um, and the fact that they call it the body without organs is really unhelpful. So let me try to define that briefly for you. The idea of the body without organs is a reformulation of Freud's notion of the death drive. So the death drive, they, Freud said that we don't have an idea of death. Um, Deleuze and Guattari say we do have an idea of death, we do have a model and an image of death, and that is the catatonic. Okay? So when we think of the schizophrenics, this is one of the reasons why Deleuze was interested in schizophrenics, is that we think of the catatonic schizophrenic as completely locked down, blocked off from the world, and that is our image of death, unable to communicate with the world, unable to respond to the world. And they take the term body that organs from Antonin Artaud, who was a, a French schizophrenic um, theatre director, film actor and so forth, uh, and sometime member of Surrealism, although like every other member of Surrealism was duly booted out of Surrealism, uh, with only Breton as, <laughs> as the surviving <laughs> Surrealist. Nobody else Morgan. could measure up to him. Um, but Artaud wrote a poem in which he famously said to sort of you know, that he was going to have done with the organs and he wanted the body without organs. Now, loads of people have kind of, you know, poured over this and wondered what the hell it means. Um, if you read all of Deleuze's work, what it becomes clear is that what they mean by the body without organs is that moment when the body and the mind, everything shuts down. So what are the organs? The organs are the demands on the body, the demands on the mind. You must think this, you must feel that, you must do this, and so on. Until eventually, in the schizophrenic's case, they say, no more, just nothing. I stop, everything shuts down, closed down. So the idea of the body out organs then is, it is the limit of what you can endure, the limit of what you can deal with, the limit of what you're prepared to do in order to continue to be part of society. So Arto elsewhere wrote that he said that he preferred to go mad rather than have to continue to deal with society. That society was too frustrating, too annoying, and that he would rather just be mad and be done with it. That's the body that organs. Now, what Deleuze Guattari is saying is that, in, in effect, all of us stand on our own body that organs. We all have a limit. We all have a point at which we would say, I can't go past that. Now, one of the ways by which you can think about this, um, so the, the movie, I find quite evocative in this respect is the film Zero Dark Thirty. Now, what's really interesting about this is that the female character in that has a moment where somebody asks her, you know, why didn't you sleep with so-and-so? And she said, I just realised that I was not that person, okay? That I was not that person. I wasn't the person who slept with this guy and whatever, whatever. The point is that where you say, I'm not that person, this is who I am, I'm not that, that is your body that organs. That's where you've drawn a limit and you said, I'm not that person. 
okay? So in terms of the way in which Deleuze and Guattari think about it with respect to, say, therapy, when you're you know, telling somebody not to be an alcoholic or whatever, you're trying to say to them, you're not that person anymore. You, you're going to have to draw that line and say, OK, so I recognise that I have a problem with alcohol, if you like, but now I'm not going to be that person. Now, this is simplifying a great deal, but their point is that, that everyone's construction of themselves rests on a line where we sort of draw a line and say, that's who I am and that's not who I am, OK? So, in, in life, we are constantly being pushed towards those kinds of lines to say, am I that person? Am I the person who can live with this? Am I that person who will make that compromise? W what am I prepared to do? Okay. So some friends of mine um, at the University of Wollongong have been doing some research around um, sustainability. And they interviewed a couple of hundred people in Wollongong and they were quite interested in what it would take for the, to get people to stop using their cars. And what they found, which was really interesting, is that these were middle class people and they, did, they, they were assiduous recyclers. They recycled everything. They were really careful about you know, using only sustainable products, blah, blah, blah. But they would not stop driving. They wouldn't stop taking the car to drop the kids off at school to do this, to do that, or whatever. So their, their sense of their self was really bound up in this idea of being you know, automobile, if you like. So it's those kinds of questions, and I think that's what's re what they're trying to get at with the idea of the body that organs. Where does becoming fit into that? Well, the idea of becoming is as your sense of yourself breaks down, it breaks down into a series of becomings, which Deleuze and Guattari refer to as intensities. Now, intensities are feelings, if you like, that have no extension, not that you just think, oh, so intense. Intensity means without extension. What that means is it's a feeling for which you cannot name. Because if you could name it and you could say it's this, it would have an extension, okay? So becoming is an intensity, it's feelings without extension, feelings that you can't name. And that, in a sense, is what you are provoked to do every time you come up against the limit of who you think you are, where your line in the sand is. And those are the becomings, okay? Now, in the case of the schizophrenic, what they say is that the schizophrenic is dis sort of disintegrates under the pressure of their disease, if you like and they disintegrate into becomings. But out of those becomings, they're trying to put together a scenario that will enable them to continue to exist. And so in the case of uh, Schreber, he decides that he is a woman and that he's gonna have children with God, and that's how he's able to negotiate and, and deal with the pressures of his illness. But those are his becomings, okay? It's not that he's literally becoming a woman, but rather he has a set of feelings that he can't make sense of except to say, well, that's what it feels like. It feels like God wants me to have children with him, and once he decides that that's what it's about, he's able to make peace with his feelings and he can exist. So that's the idea of becomings. They, they sit on top of, of a notion of the body without organs. Um, they talk about it specifically with respect to schizophrenia as an illness, but they want to say that this is true for all people, that, but it, we feel it in a less extreme way. But if we wanted to think about our existence in the ways by which daily life compels us to make compromises with things and, and compromise our values around, say, sustainability or politics or, or whatever, OK? Yep. Um, and I often think of the, the idea of becoming. It, it, it's, an, um, it's a very old philosophical discussion between becoming and being, too. And so I think that. Um, Deleuze and Guattari's take up of it is very innovative in a sense, but they're kind of inserting themselves in a historical discussion about these concepts too. And there's quite a lot of literature on that, I think. And, and Deleuze and Guattari do a great job of sort of subverting that a little bit, in my opinion. Um, um, I think, I think in, in education, I think becoming's been taken up quite a bit um, um, in, in wonderful, terrific ways, actually. Um, and in precisely in the ways that you, you discussed, uh, Ian, very much so, um, kind of the limit of what you're prepared to do, or in this sense of yourself breaking down. And I'm immediately um, thought of um, um, like Deb, Deborah Udell's work or Anna Hickey Moody, um, where they're talking about the subject in relation to um, uh, disability, for instance, or being sexed in a particular way. Um, I'm also struck um, thinking about Alicia Youngblood Jackson's work on becoming girl, in a sense. Um, and here I think that education has done some really neat ways of thinking about that. Um, excuse me. Um, um, 
I think what's important in education is how the actual pedagogy or curriculum can contribute to processes of becoming, in the sense that that is some of, that may be a plane of eminence or a materiality at least that can contribute to um, certain amounts of becoming as well, um, which that would include the sedimentations of becoming as well. Um, and I think in education, then, this becomes a somewhat controversial idea of becoming, particularly when we think of um, the body as being or as an identity. Um, and I think that there's some really wonderful um, political scholarship in education that is beginning to wrestle with this a little bit. And um, I'll refer to Simone Bignal in just a second, but in relation to the post-colonial, for instance, uh, Simone Bignal is doing some really wonderful work, and I'm going to pick that up a little bit later. Um, but I also think Eileen Honan, our very own Eileen Honan, is doing some wonderful work about thinking about teacher becomings, particularly in um, space, uh, uh, spaces that are attempted to be smoothed around effective teachers. Um, and what that means. And so Eileen's actually done some very good work in working with teachers about what it means to be an effective teacher or becoming an effective teacher, perhaps in the smooth space of um, teacher deficit where one is sort of um, not effective or ineffective in a sense. Um, and Eileen's done some really wonderful work where she sits down with teachers and, and in a sense maps their thinking, but they're, be they're becoming ineffective or effective or inadequate or adequate in this sense. Um, so the, again, we're, re we're talking about becoming an education with various bodies in this sense. Um, and I think uh, that's a nod to you, Eileen, there. Yay. Um, I think you've done some great work there. Um, there you go. Yeah, perfect. A um, couple other things I'd like to think, too, is that this idea of becoming heterogeneous elements or that it's not just about this anthropomorphic um, 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 idea of the body, although that's an important one. And I'm thinking of Stephen J. Ball's work about a policy becoming, really important, I think, um, where, in fact, this, the, the, the subject might become policy in this sense. We become um, perhaps what we would consider an inanimate object or something. Um, I think Stephen um, Ball is doing some very good work around becoming policy. Um, and then, of course, Noel Goff right here um, has done some really interesting curriculum work around science and becoming, um, and cyborg. And uh, you know, I, I confess, I'm not sure I completely understand, but I do think that there's something wonderful in, in Goff's work that's helping us think about the very idea of becoming and curriculum here. Um, and um, I hope he keeps at it in a sense. Uh, perhaps only that's just a personal plea. And then I think, I think at this point there, and the, uh, I really enjoy this idea of intensity, because I think it's, a, it's a, um, an idea that, again, it's my second you know, plea for more, more work in education on intensity. Um, I really do. I mean, affect is important, becomings are important, but there's something crucial here, I think, with intensity that I think we could pick up a little bit more. I think we could actually contribute to Deleuze and Qatari studies on this idea of intensity. Um, and it, for me, it's actually a site of politics, too this idea of the limit you're prepared to go to, or in the sense of yourself breaking down. I think that these are not just something that happen. Um, these are things that are, um, uh, as, as Ian put it, they're things that you must do, these expectations in which we work in, and so on and so forth. Um, and so I, I would just probably end there, at least on becoming, to think about intensity as a side of politics, which we might explore very much in education. So, questions? Um, a quick one. Um, you, you might have skipped over it, but I might not have got it either. You mentioned sedimentations of becoming. I was wondering if you could expand on that for me, please. Um, probably in the sense, probably in the sense of the catatonic that uh, was, was mentioned earlier here, um, where, we're, where things have, be, have come to rest, they're, they're no longer flow, that there is the death there in that sense, um, that there's no more, um, if we use Artaud as the example, he, he's prepared not to be sedimented anymore in who he's becoming. He's rather, he'd rather prefer to go out there and live the schizophrenic life. Um, and so in that sense, when things come to rest,
hope that helps. Uh, um, I think I'm just asking for a bit of wisdom and wanting to hear your perspectives on thinking about with, think this, with uh, schizophrenia and um, body without organs and becoming. Uh, I've been trying to grapple with perhaps how we might draw, I don't know if it's drawing an analogy or things to draw out of it, in thinking about students that are fixed with the label at risk, um, as well as I guess students who might not communicate verbally, uh, as well as others, or students with autism, all those sorts of things. Any comments about that area or how the, uh, that those concepts might be helpfully used in thinking about those things? If you want. Um, I'm trying to pass this one off because it sounds like they're too hard question. Um, one of the books that I would recommend that you read of Deleuze Guattari is there's a book that Guattari didn't write um, called uh, Molecular Revolution in Brazil. Um, and you probably heard me recommend this before. So he didn't write it in the sense that he went to Brazil four times and while he was there he spoke to everybody, um, it seems, including the future president, Lula. Um, and then Suli Rolnik put together all these talks. So one of the things that he says there, which I think is, is pertinent to your question, is that problems like that, if you like, it, problem in the sense of um, intellectually challenging, demand invention. Um, and to refuse, as I say, we should refuse both the problem and the answer. And come back to the whole situation and think, well, what are we trying to achieve here? Our assumption is that they're not communicating and because we don't understand them, but what if they are communicating and we're too stupid to understand them or we don't have access to their language? How do we reinvent that situation that is amenable? Um, and so what Guattari did in his work at Laborde was to take the view that if we don't understand the schizophrenics, that's not their problem they're fairly sure that they're communicating perfectly. It's our problem. And so therefore we have to be prepared to be inventive. We have to be prepared to transform ourselves. And one of the things he says about the idea of becoming is that nobody becomes alone. You always become in relation to someone else or to something else. And so that as the schizophrenic is in the process of their becoming, we must also become. We must become part of their world if we want to be part of it if we want to communicate with them and to understand. How you deal with that in, you know, within a policy framework with a set of funding constraints, so on and so forth, is obviously not straightforward and not easy. But one of the things that Guattari says in the Molecular Revolution book, which is quite surprising, uh, and a lot of people don't sort of recognise this, but Guattari was enormously effective at getting grants. He got tons of money out of the French government. Um, and he, he said, You've, you've got to be inventive. You've got to recognise the nature of the system that you're in and be inventive and force the system to bend and create, if you need to, create new institutions. Um, and so that's what he did in both in France but also with his colleagues in Brazil was to talk about the necessity of inventing new institutions. To say, well, if the current institution doesn't work, then don't try to fix it create a new one. You can't reform something that is misconceived from the start. What you can do is invent something new. So reject both the problem and the solution uh, and be creative. Did you want to answer Maybe just as a reference, I mentioned Deborah Udell earlier, but I think, um, um, I think she's done some terrific work on that issue of disability specifically, and maybe um, um, in applying some of the ideas of becoming that we were talking about. Also, um, less Deleuze and Guattari, but I thought it was a wonderful piece by Bernadette Baker. Um, about 2002, or, um, around um, the hunt for disability um, and, the, and the new eugenics, which I think I was kind of picking up in your comment there, where I think um, Bernadette does an excellent job in the conclusion, I mean, it's a wonderful essay, but in the conclusion, she really picks up the idea of difference, which is a huge concept uh, here in, are we, we're not doing that one. That, that's for another symposium. But um, um, I do think Bernadette does a wonderful job thinking through difference in relation to the, the, the category of disability. I'm sure there's hundreds. I can, I, my, I'm limited to, that's the best I can do. So, um, just before you go on, um, you know, Dan 
That's his name, isn't it? Dan Goodley. 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 Dan Goodley. Um, yeah, has uh, written some fantastic work, uh, a kind of a Deleuzean lens of the whole concept and naming and categorising and, um, and uh, creating this category of disability. He is. Something. Something that's advertising with a lady bag. Yeah. Has been told to you. Mm. Um, and I'm like t just taking up that, um, you know, plea for more educational research around that issue of intensities. I'm or, um, thinking about, you know, the, the context at the moment of uh, teachers in classrooms being. Uh, so dispirited and so kind of taken to the edge of their becomings um, because of the pressures for me uh, in literacy, um, of literacy teachers, of kind of continually being narrowed and, and confined and said, this is how you be a literacy teacher in Australia at this very moment and kind of thinking about a way of, of working with that to try and kind of think about the intensities afforded by those situations. And maybe on this too, I think that um, it's, it's that policy too can contribute to the breakdown. Okay, and I think that's really important that, that it, it is policy at times that can um, generate the intensities. Yeah. And so I think that's the relationship that's really important, I think, and how we understand and where this policy is happening. And that's really important to think about in relation to, I mentioned Stephen J. Ball's work, about how even policies themselves are becoming in relation to contributing to certain breakdowns or intensities. C. C is for cutting edge of assemblage. Um, I'm conscious that we're going to probably run out of time since I'm droning on and speaking too slowly. So I'm going to collapse the next two and talk about desire and cutting edge at the same time. Um, this was always kind of at the back of my mind. Each of these concepts you should have figured out by now is intimately related to the next. OK. Um, so we've talked about becoming. We've talked about affect. Deleuze and Guattari say in A Thousand Plateaus that becoming is affect, so that they are, in fact, the same thing. So that was sneaky of me to separate them out like that. Um, <laughs> but they also write about them quite separately too. The, the crucial thing to remember though with becoming is that it's, it is outside of the tradition that um, Taylor's talking about in, in the sense that they do not see that the becoming ever results in something that has become. So uh, it's not about you become a woman, it's the feeling of becoming woman. So it's quite different. Um, and it's precisely outside of that model that you will become something like that. So I suppose in terms of thinking about becoming teacher, it's the anxiety around being a teacher, um, not necessarily the process of becoming a teacher. Okay, so qu quite separate in that respect. Now, the idea of the assemblage then, um, this is one of those words that looks French but isn't. Uh, it's in fact the translation. The original French word was agencement. Now, the translation of it as assemblage is acceptable, but perhaps misleading. Um, a better translation, I think, would be the idea of arrangement. Okay, It's an arrangement. And it's a better translation because it's spatio-temporal. When you make an arrangement, you are making a, a, an arrangement of things both in space and time. So the assemblage then refers to the set of practices the processes, the ideas, the arrangement that you make to deal with the affects and the becomings that you have. So your assemblage is your way of living, but understood that you live that way because you have those affects, you have those becomings, that it is necessary to you to live that way. In this sense, the assemblage is a reformulation, and Guattari says this quite explicitly, it's a reformulation of the idea of what Jung referred to as the complex, um, or what Freud might have called the symptom. Okay? But we don't have to think of it in purely pathological terms. We can see it simply everybody has an assemblage. We all have a, a way of proceeding. 
And those assemblages have cutting edges, cutting edges in the sense that there are practices that you do every day, routines that you perform, that if they are disrupted, cause you to kind of collapse. You think, oh, I, I just can't get going today because I didn't do this or I didn't do that. And maybe you didn't have your coffee or you didn't you know, do your, go for your run before work or, or whatever it is. But you have your assemblage, your way of arranging your life, your routines, your practices that enable you to function. Now, when I was uh, in Stockholm running this workshop on Deleuze um, and pedagogy, one of the things we spent a lot of time thinking about was the idea of the classroom as an assemblage. Now, it's quite an interesting problem because whose assemblage is it? Is it you as the teacher or is it the kids? Is it you know, the government saying you must do this, that and the other? So what, this is a really good example of the idea of complexity. It's, it's everyone's assemblage. There is a collective assemblage, and this is something that Deleuze and Guattari talk about a lot. There is a collective assemblage, the assemblage that you all participate in, but then there are individual assemblages, and then there are group assemblages, you know, the assemblage between the three boys who sit at the back of the room all the time, and they've got their thing going on. So when we're trying to think about the idea of assemblage, we're thinking about arrangements, and we're thinking about arrangements that interlock, that overlay one another, that can be highly localised, but they can also be globalised, Okay, with you know, the announcement of the PISA results, what's happening in the classroom now is global in a sense. You know, it's linked to other kinds of outcomes which the three boys in the back really couldn't give a bugger about. But nonetheless, it's part of their assemblage. What happens in their day is determined by factors and elements that are you know, way beyond their interest. Okay? So the idea of the assemblage then is really about arrangements. And we could tweak it further and say arrangements that work and arrangements that don't. And what are the elements that make something work? And what are the elements that cause it to decay and to fall apart? What enables it to endure? What causes it to be disrupted? And Deleuze and Guattari have this very interesting idea of what they call an assemblage converter. And one of the examples they give is that there's, I can't remember the guy's name, but there was a, a psychoanalyst working um, in France in the 1970s. And one of the things he he was a researcher, one of the things he did was to start taking tape recorders to sessions and to record what was said in the session um, and then play it back to the psychoanalysts. And, and, and so they said this was an assemblage converter because now that relationship between analysts and analysand was, was transformed. There was a new layer of temporality that was added to it. So when we think about the classroom, we're thinking of, we were always thinking about assemblage converters. So it might be a question of how do I manage those three boys? What will convert their assemblage into something that is you know, more productive? Which raises another kind of question, going back to the, my first question, in the sense of whose assemblage is it? Who defines whether it's working or not working? Um, one of the questions that they're putting before us around this idea of working or not working, or what is productive or unproductive, Deleuze and Guattari are very reluctant to talk about ethics, but when they do talk about ethics, they talk about it in terms of what is sustainable, what can be sustained. So there are practices that we perform, so they give the example of the alcoholic. The alcoholic drinks in order to achieve a certain kind of intensity, but it's not sustainable because they can't maintain it without drinking and they're always at the risk of going too far and it collapses and they have to start all over again. So there's a certain kind of intensity that they're trying to achieve, but it's not sustainable. So in terms of thinking about the assemblage, there is this kind of ethical question at the back of it for them, ethical in the sense of ethos meaning life. What is sustainable? What are, what are the sustainable assemblages and what makes them sustainable and who are they sustainable for? And I suppose at the other end of the spectrum, the, the, the larger question is about how do the different assemblages interlock? What are the elements that bring those assemblages together? And this is where we're dealing with heterogeneous components because the kids in the classroom, the teacher dealing with PISA and, you know, and NAPLAN and all those other things, these are heterogeneous elements and they're not necessarily elements that easily tie together in a way that creates a working arrangement. So in terms of analysing the classroom or thinking about the classroom, it's being able to identify the full complexity of elements that are at play and to ask, well, how do they interact? What, what are the machines, if you like? This is a, a term that Deleuze and Guattari use a lot. What are the machines 
but bring these elements together and force them to interact. Okay? So when Deleuze and Guattari are talking about the cutting edge, they're saying that there are elements in the machines that work, elements that don't, elements that would cause it to collapse, elements that would enable it to be transformed and to go on and do something else. Um, so the cutting edge is important, being about knowing where the limits of things are. Now I said I would collapse this into, into desire and I think I still will do that just so we can keep it going. One of the definitions of desire, desire is an enormously difficult concept to define within Deleuze and Guattari, but one of the ways I would want to define it is desire is pure experience. Pure experience, the passage of time, the passage of time as affect. Okay? Now, why I'm defining it that way is that it, they are very clear that they don't want desire to be understood as the desire for or the desire to. Okay? So it's not I desire to do something or I have a desire for something. Desire, they define it as production. They say it is production. They have this concept of desiring production. Well, what do they mean? What are we actually producing? Well, if, if you just kind of pause for a moment and you switched your phone off and you stared into a tree or something and you thought, well, what is actually happening? You're receiving all kinds of sensational inputs. You're experiencing time itself passing. But you're also experiencing a sense of, why well, do I feel calm? Do I feel agitated? Do I like this tree? Do I want to move on? Do I want to do something else? That is desire. Desire is your ability. Can you sit still or do you have to get up and move? Do you have to go and do something? Okay, so desire is what moves you, what with the elements that you produce, the intuitions, the ideas. It's not a desire for or a desire to. Those are what Les Guattari referred to as apparatuses of capture. Our desire is captured. So we have a mobile phone and we can't spend five minutes just doing nothing because we've got a phone in our pocket. We think, oh, well, no, I'll just check Facebook or, or, or whatever. But that's, in a sense, we're, we're experiencing our desire being captured. Okay? A really good example of what they mean by the capture of desire. So when they say, they have a famous sentence, if there was one pure drop of desire in the classroom, it would cause it to explode, that's what they mean. How would we get to a point of desire that wasn't multiply captured, wasn't coded, overcoded, wasn't captured by a whole range of things, including commodities, the desire to have this, I want to do that, so on and so forth. What would pure desire look like? Okay? And that's where we would think about the idea of the cutting edge, because the cutting edge is where pure desire would be. Pure desire would be what would cause those things to explode, would enable us to go beyond. Thanks. Um, so I'm just going to go back to assemblage or cutting edge real quick. Um, and then go to desire. Um, and I, I shared this with Ian too. I often think of a, uh, arrangement in my thinking of assemblage. I think for me it's much more helpful as well. Um, and um, um, however, think however you like. But I, I do think uh, by, by not thinking about arrangement, we miss some really key parts of what assemblage can be. Um, in education, I think um, maybe I'll just tie it up to, I'll just extend Ian's idea of the classroom as a site of, of, of arranged and assembled um, pieces there. Um, and I'm going to pick up this question of who defines that. It's really important. Um, because classrooms, I would say, are also arranged um, <laughs> com complexly, right? I don't mean that in that complexity sense. Their classrooms are in schools, which are in communities, which are also in relation to policies, which I mentioned in that sense too. So these classrooms then, who owns them is a fascinating question. It's something I think educational research has done a, quite a good job here. Um, contemporarily right now, I think Greg Thompson's doing some really neat work and Sam Seller in relation to um, who owns the classroom and in what ways are owned, uh, the classrooms being owned in that sense. How are classrooms and schools been arranged, if you will, uh, in the policy landscape? Um, um, in this sense, I think uh, Greg picks up this question of Deleuze's kind of wonderful phrase of new weapons, in a sense of how this, that the, who controls the classroom as a site of politics and educational politics and policy making, which uh, I believe this, this, one of the SIGs is uh, co-sponsoring this talk. <laughs> um, also, I think Sam Seller wait, is a very interesting new weapon, or what I might say perhaps, um, uh, new deployments of current weapons with Sam's thinking about how affect 
can be in this in this space um, of controlling um, the uh, the arrangement of the classroom. And I would just nod really quickly. I know we're running out of time, but Jason Wallen. Um, uh, a colleague of mine up in Canada, the big, big nation of Canada there, thinking about how curriculum has been arranged in particular ways. And I think this is a bit, as part of who owns the classroom. Um, we don't want to leave curriculum out here. Um, and for Jason, he just specifically, I love his work when he reappropriates Carreri or the idea of autobiography and pushes it into the encounter. So, um, and I, although he doesn't use the kind of words that Ian just used with regards to desire, um, as an explosion, I get the sense that that's where I think um, Jason is thinking about curriculum as pushing it to that limit, in a sense. It's really important, I think. Um, desire. Um, that's a, it's such a huge, it's, a, it's such a huge, uh, oh my goodness gracious. Um, I think it's really important, the, the, the way Ian um, um, clarified, that it's not about desiring for or desire to. Um, rather, desire can be, in a sense, socially constituting and socially um, producing. It's not an, uh, an impulse, an individual impulse in that sense, like motivation in that sense. Um, and that's important in education, because I do think Deleuze and Guattari are speaking to, if you will, an educational psychologist you know, perspective of desire as something embedded in here. So that's something we could talk about if you want. Um, also, I do want to pick up um, this idea of desire, too, in educational research around sex education. And in a sense, sometimes desire in, in educational research can be medicalized or clinicalized, in a sense. Um, and so I think that's something we could talk about, too. That's, I don't believe at all that's what Deleuze and Guattari are talking about, in a sense, as a way to contain desire. In fact, I think if we take the idea of was it one drop of, of, fifth, of kindergartner's desire it blows the whole thing up? I think it's almost the exact opposite in that sense. We're not trying to contain it here. Um, in terms of, I, I promise to go back to Simone Bignall's work, who I think is doing some really, really interesting and important work in education right now, and in, in this country, um, around colonialization. And one of the things she's doing is picking up the desire of the colonized and the colonizer. Um, and I think it's very, very important in, in relation to particular bodies here. Um, and one of the things I think we could pick up with Deleuze and Guattari and Simone's work specifically is that um, uh, Bignall, for me, recaptures this fasciistic sense of desire, the desire th of repression that uh, you probably know the quote better than I do, but uh, uh, desire your own repression that Deleuze and Guattari talk to in relation to desire. Did I say it right? Oh boy, close enough. Anyway, um, here, Bignall, some of Bignall's work is to sort of reclaim that fasciistic desire and what she calls inverted back into a post-colonial agency as a way to rethink um, a desire, but both as a, as a, spot, a, a spot of educational politics. Um, finally, I want to pick up on desire um, this this idea of what moves you, desire as producing, um, desire what moves you. There's just a tremendous amount of wonderful educational research going on on this, uh, how Deleuze and Qatari have influenced educational research. And, um, and I think, and I'm just gonna reappropriate desire just for a second to mention this wonderful literature out there right now, whether it's desirous or not. Um, Maggie McClure, um, um, thinking about how we might code desire uh, or coding as wonder. Um, uh, n not to mention David Cole twice, but I will. I think it's wonderful about losing oneself in data uh, with regards to, with desire. Again, Anna Hickey Moody, Affect is Method, uh, Lisa Mazai, Desire and Mapping of Subjectivity specifically. Um, I could go on, but I'd maybe just finish with Brawin Davies and Elizabeth St. Pierre thinking about desire in relation to research as writing. So this idea of the space in which one is sort of consciously um, working with, as best they can, ideas of representation and desire. So they have some wonderful pieces um, and, and different pieces about the, the act of writing, um, struggling with this um, uh, problem of representation. And they, they see that as a site of educational research specifically. So some wonderful pieces there.
Hi, can I ask a question about scale in relation to assemblages? Because you were talking about the classroom um, and the, you know, the group of boys at the classroom. I'm asking the man a question. Um, do you want to ask him a question? No. Um, <laughs> and I wanted to ask you about thinking about assemblages at, uh, at other scales. And I guess I'm thinking about bigger scales. Yeah, look, thank you for the question. Um, one of the ways by which, uh, so the, the uptake of assemblage or what has been called assemblage theory um, via the work of Manuel de Landa. Now, Manuel de Landa, I think, is, is wrong on many levels. Um, and there's two ways in which he's wrong, which are important. First of all, he's wrong because he quite explicitly says he's not going to deal with the question of desire. But secondly, he's wrong because he treats the assemblage as scalable, that you go from small assemblages to medium-sized assemblages to bigger assemblages. So you, t you start with you know, a village that becomes a town, that becomes a city, and that becomes a mega city, and so on. And Deleuze and Guattari are quite explicit that it's not scalable, because the assemblage, th there are multiple assemblages sitting on top of each other and imbricated with one another. So in other words, there is the assemblage of each individual child making their arrangement with their particular kind of space, but their assemblage is not necessarily smaller than the assemblage of the classroom. In many ways, it's bigger, because they don't give a fuck about what's happening on a global scale. They care about what's happening around them. So to speak about it in terms of scale is completely wrong um, and not helpful. So rather, what's important is how does the assemblage work for the person that's you know you're talking about, and then how do you integrate and think about in a in a complex way the interactions? So the more interesting ways of thinking about this would be to pick up on the concept of interoperativity. So interoperativity is one of the things that uh, so urban studies uh, people talk about, which is if you're thinking about a city and you've got you know the bin man picking up the bins at 4 a.m. and waking up the whole street then there's a kind of interoperativity problem there because on the one hand, your rubbish is getting picked up, but everybody else is being pissed off about it because you're waking them all up. So it's not interoperative because it's not enabling the other system to work, uh, the system of people sleeping and so forth. So interoperativity is a better way of thinking about the relationships between assemblages rather than a scaling way of dealing with it and to think about what are the elements. So the other way of looking at it is, well, the thing about assemblages is that we can have multiple elements in common. So my assemblage, I'm dealing with the curriculum that's in front of me right now, but I didn't write that, that curriculum. Somebody else wrote that. And so we have elements in common. So the ways for which the assemblages come together are always social and they are always political because who decides? So for example, you know, Deleuze and Guattari would say sexuality is always political because as soon as you say that you are hetero or straight or whatever, you're making or you're responding to social ways of coding what is an appropriate use of your desire but why can't your desire go in other kinds of directions so it's always political so the assemblage in that sense is always political it's always multiple it's always engaged in multiple other assemblages but you can't scale it up from small to big rather you scale it up probably in terms of near and far the assemblage that is close to you the assemblage that's far away from you but nonetheless you are part of so you can think of language itself. We're part of a language assemblage that we are sharing, even with people we don't know, even with you know people far, far away, as it were. Um, so that's, that would be the most important thing. And the other thing that Delanda does, as I said, is he takes desire out of the equation. Um, and so therefore, you have this strangely inert system, or this strangely inert idea of the assemblage. Um, and interestingly, Latour does the same thing. If you look at Latour and you look at his definition of networks, the networks are interoperative, but there's no desiring element. There's no element thereby within those systems that can just simply throw them apart. I mean, if you think about, I mean, Billy Connolly always tells a joke um, about pilots getting on the plane. And, and he says, you know, whenever he's flying, he always wants to be sure that the pilot is in a good mood. Um, because if he's not, or she's not, and is feeling suicidal, I mean, that could really ruin your day, right? Um, so in other words, affect and, and desire and everything comes into that in, in, in really important kinds of ways. Uh, so that, that aspect of the system um, is something that we always want to try to figure out, well, how do we deal with it? And if you are a new teacher, I remember the first time I, I was teaching swimming, 
which doesn't sound you know, particularly complicated, but then you think about you've got four-year-olds in deep water and if you mess that up, they drown. Um, and I was you know, a ridiculous teacher because I thought, well, you know, the first thing to do is to take them to deep water, of course, and you know, my supervisor was horrified. Like, she said, what on earth are you doing taking these kids to deep water? I was like, oh, I don't know. Um, so you know, the way by which the system and desire and, and all those things come into the system means that it's never fully systemic. It's never fully automatic. It's never fully the kind of machine that policymakers want it to be. Of course it's not. It's always multiple, it's always complicated, and there are heterogeneous elements that can't be pre-programmed that you can't even prescribe for. No, I, I, uh, I think it's a great question, and one that I puzzle over in my own work on how to deal with it, um, just to speak um, for myself. Um, I think that's why I often prefer the, the arrangement, the, the, the idea of the arrangements rather than the assemblage, to think about how they're, they're composed, these different assemblages in relation to each other and the com common elements that run through them. So I use the example of the classroom related to the, the school, so that they're different assemblages, but yet they're still connected in some sense, or the community. And that, that they're not, in that sense, they're, I'm not sure they're scaled out, but they're certainly different assemblages. And anyone who's worked in any, any one of those three spaces can uh, clearly recognize that they're onto themselves, too, in many ways. Um, that is, the classroom ignores the school, uh, or the school ignores the community in that sense, right? Their assemblage is operating in that sense. Um, but per, I still, I think there's something that puzzles me, though, with this concept of scale in relation to the assemblage. Um, and I'd be curious, who, I'm not sure who asked that question, but uh, um, it was it, with regards, maybe we, maybe we pick that up as a conversation around the three kids in relation to this idea of scale and how we're thinking about that, because it's one that really puzzles me to some extent too, especially from the vantage of policy, which is trying to do, which is, you know, create this incredible sort of smooth space of the classroom in a sense. That is, so I'll just leave it at that. Thanks. Um, I'm just wondering if you could comment briefly on the relationship between desire and interest. So in Anti-Oedipus, Deleuze and Guattari talk about the older generation um, being critical of the younger generation for pursuing their desires rather than investing in their interests. Um, and education might be one example, it seems to me, a sort of example that applies to, to what teachers often are expected to do with young people. So I just wondered if you could comment on that. Yeah, I mean... For Deleuze and Guattari, they say both the idea of interest but also the idea of need or even the idea of lack, that all these things have to be manufactured. So in order to think about interest, well, what is my interest? Interest is socially constructed and in the precise sense that you're talking about there, so it's you know, the older generation, whoever that is, um, is saying, well, you need to buy a house or you need to get a secure job or you need to do these kinds of things. Um, but their interest has to do with making an arrangement within a certain kind of social structure that rewards certain kinds of activities and certain kinds of um, investments, if you like. It's probably, I mean, on that, I'm prompted to remember that one of the things that Deleuze and Guattari talk about with the idea of desire is that the process of desire for them is investment. So in, in the original French, it's investiment. But what we do with our desire is we invest it. So we invest it in ideas, we invest it in practices, we invest it in processes. Um, and so the idea of need then is, is a capture of that investment. We invest our desire in that particular kind of thing. In that situation though, what they're talking about, they're actually critical of both. They're just as critical of people who say, pursue your needs as pursue your desires because in that instance, what they mean by desires is, um, you know, going after commodities and, and having certain kinds of experiences, and, and not necessarily uh, to do with a sort of growth of the self, if you like, or a development of your of your personality. So I think what's important for them is that sense by which the idea of desire is invested, but that desire is constantly being tempted to invest in particular kinds of processes, particular kinds of practices. Uh, and that commodification is the single most powerful example of that. <clears throat> oh, uh, no, I, yeah, I want to ask Ian a question, though, about um, putting desire and, uh, oh, 
Okay. No, no, I think we should move on. Uh, later on, I would like to ask him, though, on this, que uh, Ian, this qu question about perhaps where desire uh, and interest could diverge in, in relation to the schizoanalysis, rather than just following one or the other um, as a way, uh, as a possible politic. But go on, let's move on. I know time is short. <clears throat> okay, well, I feel like we've totally failed to provoke provoke you enough to ask. I would have thought talking about desire, you know, we would be getting there with the... Uh, I did think someone was attacking about attacking Delanda, but no one has taken the bait. Lucky so five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, we've got to throw in some hand grenades from time to time. Um, okay, so the, the last term that we kind of have put up on our abecedaire, but if we have more time, we can maybe move on to F is for something. Um, and the term, the next one is event. Now, event is, in philosophy, uh, has been for the last 20 years or so, something of an obsession. Um, I don't know if it's an obsession in education research so much, but it certainly is within philosophy. Um, and the simple way of thinking about it is, how can you tell when something has happened? And what would it mean for something to have happened? And what's the difference between something happening and an event? So when do we just talk about something as being stuff happens, um, or has there been an event? And one of the reasons why there's been a large amount of obsession about this topic uh, is not really to, to do with Deleuze, it's actually more to do with um, Badiou. Um, and Badiou has focused on the idea of the event for political reasons, okay? so. What he's interested in is to say, well, when can we say that something has happened? Now, Deleuze was talking about this uh, long before Badiou really got onto this particular bandwagon, but he related it to the work of Simondon. And he proposed, and taking from Simondon, he, he says, if we were to look at the history of the French Revolution, if we wanted to know when did it start, we would have to find the moment when the peasants stop doffing their calf, caps to the aristocracy. Because then we would know that that, that, was, that was the moment when the revolution began, in effect. Because that was the moment when the authority of the aristocracy had somehow receded to the point where the peasants no longer felt that they owed them allegiance or they owed them the gesture of obeisance. So Deleuze and Watari are quite different from Badiou in this respect. Badiou is very much more that the event is kind of cataclysmic, that it, once it has happened, we, we can't but, as in Badiou's terms, cleave to it. So for, uh, for Badiou, he uses the example, he says that events are mathematical. They have a mathematical cer certainty. So for example, once, you, once they discovered that the Earth was round, you couldn't continue to say the Earth is not round you couldn't continue to say, if I sail to the Americas, I'm going to fall off the edge of the earth. That idea had become impossible. It was no longer possible to even speak in that way. Um, not only did you sound like an idiot, but nobody took you seriously. It was just simply that, that way of thinking had disappeared. Now, Deleuze Guattari, uh, I would say, probably sympathetic to this particular viewpoint. So that when we're talking about the event, we're talking about something that has shifted in such a way that we cannot go back. Now they wouldn't, I think, want to give it the same dimension of a, of a mathematical certainty, because in politics, what has mathematical certainty? We're forever going back on ideas getting recycled and not uh, disappearing. So there's, in fact, John Quiggan wrote that fabulous book uh, called Zombie Economics about you know, stupid and dangerous ideas that no matter how dumb they are, just don't seem to go away. Um, so that's perfectly possible. So the idea of the event is when can we say something has happened? When are we able to say that it's more than simply just stuff happening? It's not just noise, if you like, but it, it is actually something has happened. And their examples are usually from the aesthetic realm. So that when, for example, a new piece of music is constructed or a new form of artwork comes into being. From that moment, it suddenly becomes possible to do new things. So when we think of modernism, you know, the reason why modernism continues to resonate for us today is that we see it as being a kind of seismic moment in Western art, whereby a range of new ways of doing art came into being, and a range of other ways of doing art sort of somehow disappeared. But what was more important, in a sense, was that 
and what happened with modernism is that modernism said it's no longer the case that what came before must decide what can come afterwards. Okay? So it was an event in that sense. An event in the sense of creating a rupture that we no longer take what came before as determining what can come afterwards. So for Deleuze and Guattari, that is the fundamental idea of the event. That there is a moment of rupture whereby what happened before no longer determines what goes on into the future. And they talk about it with respect to individual psychology. Uh, and they take F. Scott Fitzgerald's idea of the crack. So Fitzgerald talks about his own life and he said, what I realised was that there are two kinds of crack. There is the kind of you know, dropping of the plate, the plate breaks in half and you suddenly see that your life is in pieces. But then there is another kind of a crack which is when you turn the plate over and you see on the reverse side of the plate that there is mi millions and myriad cracks but the plate somehow still holds together but it, it, it no longer has any tensile strength and, and it just takes a very small thing to cause it to shatter. But in either case, things have fallen apart and they can no longer be the same, they can no longer be the way that they were. And so he says that in, in our daily lives we have those cracks, we experience those ruptures, we have friendships that come to an end, we have relationships that come to an end, and they can come to an end over something as simple as you said such and such and after that I just couldn't feel the same way about you anymore. Um, and so if you connect this back to the idea of the assemblage, the assemblage is constantly trying to manage and to hold together that plate, if you like, with all those cracks occurring at the back of it. It's somehow causing it. It's always ready to shatter and fall apart. So what are the structures, what are the processes and the practices we use to keep things going despite those potential ruptures? How do we avoid those kinds of pitfalls? Um, Lacan says something quite wonderful. I'm not a Lacanian by any means, but I do like this phrase a lot. He says, we have language in order to not say what we mean. That, in other words, you know, when you're having an argument with somebody, there is a phrase that you're dying to say, but if you say it, your relationship is over. But you nevertheless must say it. So you have to find a way of not saying what you mean. Uh, and I, I've always thought that that was a really interesting way of understanding language and how it operates. Uh, and I think for Deleuze and Guattari, when you say what you mean, that brings about the crack. That is the event. There is a rupture. Things fall apart. But if you don't say what you mean, if there is a way by which you can still continue to communicate, um, then you have avoided the event. And Deleuze and Guattari take from Kafka the idea that the event is in some ways a death sentence. And that our job is to, is to find the ways of avoiding that death sentence. Thanks. Um. I think um, if it's not intensity, that I think it, education could really explore this idea of event much more, um, and it, particularly or precisely in what Ian talked about, when has something happened, for instance, in education. Um, I think uh, one of my favorite quotes of Deleuze and Guattari is th this one, the, the nature of events to which concepts summon us or enables the release of concepts. And I think here, for me, the notion of the event in education is something um, unsettling, perhaps, or dangerous, or this idea that Ian invokes around the, the moment of uh, rupture. Um, I think this is really, really important, I think, um, in education. And, and to give you an example of this is, I think, some wonderful work by Elizabeth de Freitas, um, who is doing precisely this in the mathematics classroom. And she'll take up Badu and Deleuze and Guattari's notion of um, event precisely in the way that um, Ian just spoke about it. And in the mathematics classroom, which I think is quite fun in relation to the, the conversation we're having right now. Um, and one way to think about the, the notion of the event is that um, De Fritis does two things. One is to map the kind of discourse or discussion students are having about mathematics in relation to the event. And the other one is in relation to the curriculum, and that is with relation to problem solving, a, a, very, a very kind of um, preferred trope in mathematics curriculum. And what De Freitas wants to do is, in terms of the event, look at mathematics as problemization. And that's a very big concept in Deleuze as well. And so here, when, once we take mathematics classroom as a site of problemization rather than problem solving, that we can continue to think through what the event is or what has happened in that sense in the mathematics classroom. And I just think it's wonderful um, 
what, what she's doing. I think maybe finally I'll just uh, mention the work of um, Michelino Zemblayas, uh, doing some really wonderful work on the idea of event in relation to education. And here he's talking about um, um, uh, the idea of witnessing historical trauma. When has something happened here? Um, uh, in education, in a sense, and he really he's really working with uh, school-age children in this idea of wit witnessing trauma, um, and um, and so what what uh, Zemblias helps me understand here is how we might even begin to think about trauma in relation to kids or this moment of rupture, um, which is really important and something that is often protected or in a sense um, um, not discussed. Um, I can think of all the uh, coming out of after 9-11, all of the media censoring teachers from discussing this in classrooms, for instance, in a sense. Um, and, um, uh, and maybe finally we can begin to think about these, the myriad of cracks of the broken plate as the spaces in which we can begin to sort of problematize, that is explore, and to think through what these might be. So in that sense, I think the event is a very, very rich place for education, rather than just giving answers to problems that in many ways have already been decided. To thinking then that as a teacher, um, this is the concept, this explanation of this concept is the one that really resonates with me. Um, I don't know about you, certainly the research that we listen to over the last few days, there are so many of those moments, those events, those cracks. And um, I think my life as a teacher has been continually filled with those moments when you know you can't go back. Um, so, yeah, uh, Peggy. Um, so I'm not sure how to phrase this in a way that it, that doesn't set up a dichotomy between these two options, but I'm, I'm wondering, um, does the event relate to a particular moment or like over a span of time? There can be a kind of set of events. Uh, well, nice question, thank you. Um, and I should have been more clear about this. So the event in this sense is not tied to a specific temporality. Um, so in the case of the, of the French Revolution, the French Revolution didn't occur at the precise moment that the peasants stopped off in the calf, but it started then. Um, and so some might say it continues. Um, so you know, Habermas's great argument about the idea of modernity, he says you know, the modernity project has barely got started so it's too early to give up on it. Um, so the time scale of, of events doesn't have to be a punctum. It doesn't have to be a, a singular moment, but it can be. But they can take you know, decades, years, centuries, if you like. So for example, the idea of the Anthropocene is an event. I mean, an event in the sense of it has happened, is happening. We've, we don't yet fully understand what its effects on us are going to be. But as one of my um, PhD students um, says, from now on, we are post-nature. We are, any understanding of, of our environment has to factor in elements that are not purely natural or an idea of nature that is now deeply affected by human activities. So the event of the Anthropocene was, in a sense, at that moment that we finally realised it. Um, I mean, fortunately, we live in a country that has managed to solve climate change. Um, you know, <laughs> we have a prime minister blessed with omniscience um, who was able to just simply solve at a stroke that particular issue. I and mean, we do wonder what other important issues you'll be able to solve so quickly. Um, but in a sense, you know, so events can have multiple timescales. And so in that sense, the other way of thinking about particular, though, would be, does it have to be highly local or can it be universal? Now, Deleuze and Guattari are very suspicious of the idea of the universal, of, a, of an event that is universally true or universally experienced, but we shouldn't confuse universal with global. So it can be global without being universal. The Anthropocene is true for our planet, but it is not true for all possible planets. Okay? 
So universal and global are not the same thing. Um, it's highly particular, but in being particular, that doesn't mean that it can't have a planetary scale. They're the best kind. Yeah. What, what, what do actual schizophrenics think about Deleuze and Guattari's um, uh, theories of the world and the way that it works? It's a good question. Um, and there hasn't been a lot of research done on that, although it would be useful to know. Um, but. What we do know is that Guattari's work with the schizophrenics and, and, and what he wrote about them was done not in consultation with them, but rather in a kind of group environment. What they would make of his theories or the work with, with Deleuze Guattari is, is not known, and, has, and I'm not aware of where anyone ever act, recording an answer to that particular kind of a question. But my sense is that that partly what Guattari wanted to do was to, on the one hand, construct a clinic that the schizophrenics that they were working with felt encouraged to live their lives and, and, to, and to feel um, valued and to feel that, that they could do what they wanted to do. Um, and so his way of looking at it was that he needed all this theory from out here in order to help him to come up with a way of constructing a space where they could operate and, and could think and be. Um, so possibly they wouldn't have an opinion on it, or if they did, it's not known. But I do think that there is a, there is a strong sense in which that it was something that they elaborated together. And certainly that's one of the reasons why Deleuze and Guattari quote an enormous amount of material from schizophrenics, is precisely to, to not be the ones that is speaking for them, but to actually try to bring their voice, their way of saying things into the text which is what makes it rich to read. It's enormously poetic. If by poetic you mean difficult to understand and difficult to know what to do with. Um, but it also means that there are multiple voices. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that people find most difficult about reading their work is that it, it really does have multiple voices. You have to read it as being there is a kind of um, uh, you know, free, indirect speech happening, that they're channeling voices and, and they're there. But those voices aren't always theoretical voices, they're voices of experience and so forth. So it's quite hard to negotiate that as well. Can I ask a follow-up to that? Sure. So, so how do they deal with that notion of voice? I know there are many notions of voice, but if you can recall the way in which you were just speaking of voice, what does that mean to them, or to you? I think for them, they were very, very careful on this question. And so they did a number of things. One was that they were very careful to make it so that you couldn't know this section was written by Guattari or this section was written by Deleuze. So that the idea was that it was a collaborative piece, that there is a, a blending of their voices. And they're very, very clear about that. No, I know. What you, I, I understand the question, but I'm giving you two kinds of answers. First of all, from themselves, they blended their own voice. But then secondly, within the text, they allow and construct and channel and bring through other voices. And they do that in different kinds of ways. So in A Thousand Plateaus, there is a, a very nice chapter around the, the example of Professor Challenger who is a kind of fabrication that they take from a Sherlock um, Conan Doyle stories and bring that in. We're getting the wind up here, it's time to go. So we, we stop arbitrary, bring it to an end. I can try to explain it to you later, but I guess the short answer is there are multiple voices and they bring them through via quotation, but also through creative means of creating what they call conceptual persona within the text. Is that a Yes. Okay. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. I had a very rewarding. I had. Okay. The AGM of the of AARE is starting now in this room, but they've just moved. <laughs> So um, I just want to say thank you, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you, Ian and Taylor, for a uh, richly intellectual discussion. Uh, not, it's, yeah, I would have liked some fighting, arguing, <laughs> abuse. But that didn't happen, but that's okay. I think we still it's all had fine. a good time. There is a, so thank you very much and thank you. Thank you.